can anyone hear me through their headsets? Because I can't hear myself at all. Uh, let me see. Um, hello. Oh, yes, I can hear. Oh, right. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to workshop number 90. This is workshop number 90, so if you're expecting something else, then this is your moment to leave discreetly. This workshop is entitled I Freedom and Cybersecurity in the Balance. My name is Emily Taylor. I'm your moderator today. And we have a wonderful panel um, who I'll just introduce briefly. Uh, on my far left, so your right, Milton Muller, professor at Syracuse University. Uh, we have Katizia Rodri Rodriguez of EFF, uh, uh, Civil Society. Cornelia Kutera from uh, Microsoft. We have Irla Flynn, uh, Google's head of public policy from uh, Australia and New Zealand, but he's actually Irish, okay. right? <laughs> and uh, Alexander Seeger, the head of cybercrime division at the Council of Europe. Okay. So the central question that we're going to be looking at today is this, this balancing act that we heard in many of the opening speeches this morning between um, security on the one hand, law enforcement, um, and uh, on the other hand, individual rights uh, to express themselves freely, uh, to uh, have a free flow of information, uh, and their rights to privacy if those exist. So these are often presented in internet uh, governance dialogue as a, as a dichotomy. You can't have one without losing the other. And we have panelists here today from a wide range of backgrounds and experiences. And so, I mean, the, the first question, I'd like to come to you, Cornelia Kutra of Microsoft, if I may. Um, these, these laws are often viewed as clashing. So uh, data protection thwarts, um, I can't hear anything. Data protection, is it, does it just go out of the window if a policeman wants to know uh, information and how do these things coexist in practice? Is it one or the other or can it be both? Um, thank you. Um, it's a very difficult question at the very That's beginning. <laughs> <laughs> so um, maybe I should first say that um, I'm mainly working on those policy areas in the European uh, region and there is um, it's an it's exciting time um, in that region because basically all of the policy areas are actually currently revised. So what we see is we see draft privacy regulation currently discussed. We see intermediate liability currently discussed. We have a new child safety strategy that is this put in place and forthcoming the European Commission is also going to uh, issue a communication on a European cybersecurity strategy. Um, also in all member states we see these developments um, happening and so I think one of the good things and, and developments we can already see is that um, they do actually refer to each other so they recognize that there is coexistence so I would ne not necessarily say that there is a clash in principle, I think it will be more difficult when it comes to specific issues in practice where you actually have to make the decision uh, where, where the difficulties um, are, are more pre prevalent. Uh, so I think we are a step further now in recognizing these interrelations. So most of the European cyber s national cybersecurity strategies that are emerging in member state countries do actually refer to openness and freedom as well as to cybersecurity. Um, and, and therefore, in practice, we need probably more guidance in the future. So, so Cornelia, would you say that uh, if you're looking at the, you know, that the regulations and the laws that these revisions are looking to replace, which were very much before the digital age, you know, these are written in the 90s, 1990s, 
you, so what you're saying to us is that the legislators who are putting forward these drafts seem to have learnt from the experiences o online um, and that there seems to be a bit more joining up of the dots. So you're encouraged by that, are you? I'm an optimistic person, <laughs> <laughs> so yes. Um, but but of course, in the the devil lies in the detail. Uh, to give you one one example, um, in order to secure um, accounts of customers, sometimes information needs to be shared. Um, if there is a, a hack on another s service and and it it refers to Gmail or Hotmail or Yahoo, uh, if we have that information, we couldn't put security measures in place. And that is now recognized in the draft privacy regulation, but only with a small recital. So it needs to be more clear that information in those circumstances can be shared. This is just one of the examples um, to showcase that there needs to be yeah. more done. So would you say it was more lip service than actually um, uh, really felt? No, I don't think it's lip service. Um, it, it goes definitely in the right direction, um, but uh, more clarification would be necessary indeed, in that specific case in particular. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to come to you now, Milton Muller, Professor at Syracuse University. Your area of expertise has been very much looking at, uh, as I understand it, what happens in practice when there is uh, perhaps for good reasons, needs for surveillance, needs for uh, law enforcement to have access to data. Um, can, if we're looking at, in particular at the example of, say, deep packet inspection, and, and is that something that's familiar to everybody, the concept of deep packet inspection? Can you just nod your head or shake your head? Ish. Okay, so maybe a, a brief explanation of what's involved and, uh, and what what conflicts you see arising in practice between the rights of the individual and the rights of the state, if you like? Uh, thank you, Emily. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, I think uh, just to clarify my perspective, I'm approaching this from the standpoint of a social scientist who studies basically the science, technology, and society. So a new technology is somehow developed or implemented, and then you try to figure out how is that related to uh, ongoing social processes, including especially legal and regulatory processes? Um, so what you have to understand is the way uh, technologies are disequilibrating or disruptive forces, and what they disrupt uh, frequently are power relations among the actors involved. So for example, uh, one of the simplest applications of deep packet inspection was to manage and control bandwidth. And uh, uh, a lot of the internet service providers made the mistake of simply implementing this because they had the unilateral power to do so and not notifying their customers, uh, not getting any kind of uh, permissions, which in normal cases you want them to do. You want them to implement new technologies. But when these technologies are disruptive and completely rejigger power relationships among actors, uh, that's when you see these explosions happen. I mean, social and legal and uh, litigation and so on. And so in the case of deep packet inspection, what you're doing is you're actually reading the inside of a packet as it passes through the network. You're looking for signatures. You have to program it to look for certain things. In the case of bandwidth management, you're looking for, you're saying, what application is this? Is it peer-to-peer -peer or is it a, a piece of malware or is it a recognized number format, which might be a credit card? You can do all of those things uh, on different applications. Uh, so deep packet inspection, uh, we went through a period of, let's say, cowboy DPI in which uh, ISPs simply uh, started using it. Um, and then there were reactions. There were disruptions. Uh, some of them were sued. Uh, net neutrality advocates, privacy advocates reacted and played a huge role in uh, altering the structure of the industry in democratic countries in the US and uh, Canada and Europe. Uh, so the issue is how robust and resilient is your political process? 
uh, how much transparency is there turns out to be absolutely crucial. Do you actually, can you actually find out what's going on? Uh, usually the government, in terms of uh, traditional data protection regulation, is not very effective with new technologies until they're approached with a problem. They're in, in an inherently reactive position. Uh, so I would say the key takeaway from our research is the absolute importance of activists, activist organizations, uh, net neutrality advocates, privacy advocates who will constantly monitor, uh, surveil the surveillers, if you will, and be well networked enough to actually make an, a, a statement and, a, and an impact if something happens that they think is rebalancing or unbalancing those rights. Thank you very much. So you see a real role for civil society in this ecosystem as people who are, in, if you like, referees to ensure fair play and to shout loud if they don't see that happening. Well, on that note, Katitsa, perhaps I can come to you. Um, the, um, so we've heard that the legislative framework, at least in the EU, is being re reviewed, that there's a lot more uh, in the drafts, there's a lot more interaction, there's a lot more joined upness, we hope. Milton has told us about, you know, something that has been uh, deep packet inspection which which came about for one reason and then sort of ends up being used for a whole load of bad reasons if you like do you see any way that this sort of the different interests between uh, wanting to find out things for good reasons for law enforcement reasons for uh, and this involves sometimes doing quite bad things intruding on people's privacy is there any way to to uh, balance these things, do you think? Is there a positive agenda that can be followed? Um, well, uh, Milton touched a very important uh, topic, the role of civil society to be able to actually monitor and see what companies and governments, uh, how they are collecting our data, and how they're accessing our data, and whether um, they are using it or accessing it with the uh, they have legal grounds to access it. But unfortunately, most of the cybercrime and cybersecurity debate, it's shrouded in secrecy. Um, there is little information of what um, actually the government is doing with our data. I mean, some countries with governance wants to access the data, there are laws that actually give gag orders that for big companies <coughs> to notify the user when the data is accessed. Uh, we have been saying in, in EFF that uh, companies should challenge those orders whenever possible. But we think that um, the, lack of se uh, the lack of transparency, the secre secrecy around this debate is still too much. And we need to go m far beyond that just uh, complaining and shaming companies, um, asking them to please <laughs> report about transparency and I think there is a need for more detail oriented principles that uh, promo uh, that establish um, how government should uh, limit uh, access uh, citizens data while international human rights law uh, make exceptions to access to the data that they have to be prescribed by law you have to be proportionate and they have to be needed there are more detailed need on, on the obligations for uh, not only the government but companies to notify the users um, uh, when the data has been requested, um, give the opportunity to find a lawyer if they think that the challenge have no merits, um, be able to, for instance, um, uh, know more about the report of transparency that recently two companies, uh, Twitter and Google, have been issued about the number of government requests. Um, so the answer is transparency in your view. I mean, is that, is that right? I mean, one of the things, just to pick up a point from Milton about the power, the disruptive power of these technologies, and uh, perhaps I can come to you, Irla Flynn, from Google on this, because I think one of the disruptive uh, results, if you like, of, the, of what we're seeing with the internet is that a, a, a handful of companies such as Google have a, a disproportionate amount of power. They also have 
probably much more data on individuals, their user, the, the, the way that they use and interact with technologies, what they like to go and visit, what adverts they should be served with. Now, if a government had that sort of power, actual power over an individual, I think that people like Katitza or Milton would be <coughs> screaming at them. But what, um, what actual checks and balances are there on Google's power with the uh, data that it has? Um, uh, so thank you for a, an easy question to begin with. Um, and people do scream at, at us quite a lot, actually. Um, I suppose... I'm not um, going to scream at you, not at all. <laughs> that was a, 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 ge a gentle scream. Um, look, I, I suppose there's, there's a number of ways of, um, of looking at this. Uh, first of all, I think that um, uh, privacy, um, which must be underpinned by good security, otherwise it doesn't really uh, exist, uh, is very, very important. And it's very, very important for us because uh, it's, it's a key value, it's a key element of a relationship uh, that we have with people who use uh, our services. And if that's undermined, uh, then people can and do uh, leave. It's very easy to switch to another search engine or, or other services <coughs> online. So I suppose that's, uh, that's the first thing. Uh, and we believe that we, we have to work very hard to uh, get and keep uh, that good relationship um, with, with people. Um, the second thing is, uh, you know, that there is a, an extensive body of, of law around privacy around the world and privacy regulators, and uh, you see that they are not slow to hold companies to account um, when, when the occasion uh, demands it. I think there is a direct responsibility uh, specifically on the point around um, uh, security <coughs> and, and government requests. Um, and uh, I agree with, with Katizia that, that one of the key things is, is transparency, and she mentioned the um, report that we've launched. So I just want to say a little bit more about that. We, we launched this report in, uh, in 2010. It's called the Google Transparency Report. Um, and it lists in, uh, and shows in, in table and map format all the requests that we get from governments around the world for access to, to user uh, data. And we think it's important that we be transparent about that. Um, we get many requests. Um, when we get them, we check them very carefully so that they meet the, the letter and the spirit of the relevant law. Uh, the fact is that in the vast majority of cases we, we are providing the data because we believe they are valid uh, requests, <laughs> but we are checking them all uh, nonetheless. And in this transparency report, uh, we show information on uh, the volume of requests in, in each country, uh, the breakdown by service, the percentage uh, of cases where we comply. Uh, so we certainly think that transparency is important, but um, there, are, there are other um, important principles, I think, that, that have to, to come into play. Uh, I think there's a, a proportionality principle, for example. Uh, I think everyone would acknowledge that the police do need some powers to fight crime, but we need to get the balance right between the uh, risks uh, and costs that those powers might create versus the benefit uh, that is there to society in, in successfully uh, tackling crime. So proportionality and balance uh, also very, very important, as well as things like transparency, uh, due process, uh, and, and, and oversight. So there's, there's quite a set of principles, I think, that, that, that we can talk about. So um, thank you very much, Ella Flynn uh, from Google. Alexander Seeger, if I can come to you now. Listening to uh, Ella Flynn's remarks, he could, he could practically work for the Council of Europe with that. Does, is it fair to say that uh, you have no concerns whatsoever about the sort of data handling of social networks, of, of online giants such as Google? and the compromise of, of personal privacy? I would be happy to have him come to Council of Europe and bring some resources along also. Uh, I, I would like to go a step back and, and talk about the, the issue of balance that was mentioned earlier. I don't think, we had, I, I don't think it's the right approach to talk about the balance and, and, and also not the right approach to say, here's the good thing, here's the bad thing happening. Government and law enforcement is bad, privacy, freedom is right, is good and so on. It's not a question of balance really. There was a very interesting ruling by the German Constitutional Court a few years ago uh, saying that it was about uh, government wanting to install Trojans on computer in order to carry out investigations and the Constitutional Court decided or declared that 
the confidentiality, integrity and availability of computer data and system is a fundamental right of everybody. If you look at the Budapest Convention on Cybercrime, the first chapter is called Protecting of Measures to Ensure the uh, confidentiality, integrity, availability of computer data and systems because crimes, criminals uh, do exactly this. They violate computer data and systems. They violate my privacy, your privacy, and so on. So it's not a question of balance. For that reason, also the European Court of Human Rights had a number of case law rulings, a number of rulings saying that governments have the positive obligations to protect citizens against crime because, or ci not citizens, society, people against crime because crime affects the rights of individuals. I think this is very important to keep in mind. So it's an issue of reconciling different interests, like the sort of things you also mentioned here. What we need to find out is we need to develop clearer rules. We need to have better safeguards. We need to have better justification if government want to interfere in the rights of people for very good reasons, but it needs to be justified. The rules need to be clear. Uh, we need to have rules that uh, f respect fundamental rights, rule of law, human rights issues, but also data protection issues. A very interesting thing we did some years ago, uh, Google did not participate, but Microsoft participated, ISP associations, uh, police uh, agencies participated. We developed, law we developed guidelines on how law enforcement and ISP can cooperate with each other in a constructive manner, respecting those, uh, those principles that I mentioned. So is that now sorted? I mean, is that now something that is no longer an issue, the, the cooperation between internet service providers and law enforcement? What, what would you say on that, Cornelia? No, I, I think, so, so the guidelines Alexander is, uh, is mentioning is, is one part in how uh, service providers are then in a, in a process-driven way guided in how they implement um, their ways. In, in, in the case of Microsoft, for example, we are, we are part of the GNI, the Global Network Initiative, so is Google and Yahoo, and it's an increasing is community. Is part of that? Um, currently not yet. And but are people happy about that? Well, I, I think it has given uh, good guidance in how to, impl uh, how to implement the RUGI report into our own processes uh, in, in the companies in making those decisions. Uh, Microsoft at the same time has de developed over the years uh, privacy policies that are relevant to all our services. And um, so, so th these recommendations, as, as, as uh, Alexander mentioned, the, the global network principles, they are helping companies to actually implement uh, cor in, in a corporate social responsibility way um, what the Ruggie report uh, gives the human rights issues, and they are broader in our in our case. I, I'd like to also mention that we take the uh, approach in human rights, which is broader than only freedom of expression. But we look at this holistically. Um, we have just recently issued a, pro a human rights statement in explaining how we how we approach these issues, and we look at this in in terms of our products and services, our employees. We look at labor law, um, supply chain, uh, we look at our vendors, and we look at freedom of expression and privacy at the same time. And I think that is really where, where human rights should be a little bit broadened. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'm, uh, uh, Kadita wants to come in. I'm, I want to come to the audience, and also if there's anything on the remote yet, is there? Okay, please uh, think of your questions that you would like to ask this this panel on these issues of um, internet freedom versus security. Katitsa, please. Um, I would In a more con uh, concrete way, just not uh, only at the level of principles, where we saw really sometimes in this um, voluntary cooperation that sometimes it's not so much voluntary, but it's actually political pressure that it puts in companies to comply with certain obligations. And uh, we saw, for instance, cases in some South American countries where you need a court order to access the data, the police need to uh, uh, request a warrant, um, but the police just go and knock at the door. Um, because you're a friend of the provider, you just uh, hand over the data. And there are regulations right now that actually don't 
create uh, that create immunity for that voluntary sharing. And I think that we need to start talking about more about the granularity to create more obligations to forbid this kind of conduct, for instance. Thank you. Uh, Irla Flynn, did you have a response, a reaction to these comments? Well, I just wanted to add, uh, in terms of the, the kind of good principles uh, that are being developed, that uh, there was a workshop in, in Brussels last month, which I think uh, uh, Katia uh, participated in. Um, uh, it was run by Privacy International, and there was uh, a good set of principles uh, coming out there too. I would imagine there's a lot of overlap between uh, the other uh, set of principles, but I think the all, all these things help to, um, I suppose, num number one, guide the development of good public policy in this area to, to strike that, that right balance, uh, assuming balance isn't, a, isn't the wrong word, um, but also to um, regulate how these um, access systems work in practice, because that, that's important also. Um, I just want to throw out um, something from Australia, which is that the Australian government currently has a proposal to essentially replicate the uh, European Union data retention uh, directive and um, surprise, surprise, they want to um, implement legislation which will require the retention of uh, various types of data for two years. Uh, this is currently before a parliamentary committee and it's generated quite a lot of debate um, and uh, I'd be very interested in, in comments from others who have uh, been through this process in, in Europe and elsewhere um, because uh, obviously we, we and others have expressed a lot of concern with, with this, uh, very vague, seemingly very broad, uh, without a good um, you know, cost-benefit analysis to try and strike the right balance. Uh, very interested to hear about the experience in Europe and elsewhere. Uh, thank you very much, Irla. Uh, uh, I might well come to you, Alexander, for the answer on that one, but first of all, perhaps I can pose uh, Irla's question to the audience. Is there anybody in the audience here with experience of European uh, data retention in practice and whether it works? And has it, uh, can, can we have any examples, m maybe either from the audience or from the panel, of, of when that data retention has actually helped in solving a crime or bringing somebody to justice? Anyone? Well, oh, there, there, is there somebody who's asking for the mic at the back? Yes, please. So, um, excuse me, I don't have uh, experience uh, of how uh, retention of data is uh, applied I'm sorry. or implemented. Sorry to stop you, I, I don't think it's coming through on the microphone, wow. is it? She's it's talking oh, to me. Oh, it is, it's just my headset. That's, I'm just going to swap my headset. Sorry. So, sorry, please go ahead. Yeah, but... A, um, but at, uh, as legal I, uh, experts, I can tell you that uh, retention of data is very important because sometimes crimes are not di uh, discovered on a spot or directly after uh, uh, the act is committed. So uh, retention of data is important. Now, uh, in Europe, or in France, they are talking forgive uh, the right to be forgive. So it's not true, but let's uh, see the security side, the security side, and uh, the interest public, the public interest, because it's very important to find uh, proof. Thank you. Thank you very much. So it's Im very important to find proof and, and you make the, the point, of course, that uh, often people don't realise that a crime has been committed until afterwards and they need to go back. Sir, did you want the microphone? And, and I know Milton Muller would like to, to react to that. Well, there's, yeah, this is something we've d debated a lot uh, in the ICANN context uh, with regards to uh, the use of various forms of transparency of user data and there's kind of a logical fallacy that takes place here, which is the assumption that uh, if you can come up with one instance in which you had access to data and it w had led to uh, help 
cr solving a crime, then that means you should have had access to the data. But of course, this is a logical fallacy because uh, it would mean that you know we could put cameras inside all of our houses, and there would no doubt be instances in which uh, crimes would be stopped or prevented. Uh, so I agree with the Council of Europe uh, guy that um, it really has to be a rights-based approach. We have to say, well, here's where you have a right to conduct surveillance, and here's where you don't. And uh, we have to understand what those boundaries are. It's not simply a pragmatic case that uh, I got this information and it proved to be useful. Thank you. We have a, a response from the audience and then our panel's starting to hop. So uh, we'll take your question and then we'll, we'll, we'll come back to the panel. Yes, that's better, thanks. Um, I may be the, oh yes, everything is falling apart here electronically, I'm sorry about that. Um, my name is Walter Nates and I used to work for a law enforcement agency uh, two, up to two years ago, but yes, data retention does help because we don't want surveillance all the time. We, we get notifications from end users saying something's going wrong in the form of spam or malware and sometimes a case doesn't come together until six months after the first notification because there's only one. And over time, a second, a third, and all of a sudden there's a landslide. And if those messages that we want to research at, at in my former capacity, wanted to research as a law enforcement, they may be gone forever before you ever get the time to, to, to do any invest investigations. So in that sense, yes, but on the other hand, uh, only with the right sort of law behind you that makes it possible for you to do so, and n definitely not indefinitely, but whether it's a year or two years, that's for politicians to decide, but I think that a year from my past experience should be enough. So you think that the a year strikes the right balance between intrusion and proportionality? Uh, Milton, is that an? I, I'm sorry to pick on you because I, I'm not picking on you, but I kind of am. Milton was talking about a logical fallacy there, of well, this has proved useful to us, and I'm sure, you know, if you are investigating a crime, then any evidence uh, that that is to the point is useful to have. So, can I come to you, Alexander Sega from the Council of Europe? Does that make it right to collect it in the first place? I would like to point at the risk here. If you want to kill any sensible discussion, just raise the issue of data retention. Oh dear, too late. It's too late, so it's done. Uh, okay, if you talk to law enforcement, they will all, almost all of them, follow the line that Wout just said. They believe it is important, they know it is important, they use it. And you can see why, wait, can't you? But I wait, mean wait a moment. They do not dare to talk about it in public anymore. They don't participate in meetings when, when, like, like this. They are not allowed to talk in public because the whole thing has been so politicized. The result is you don't get the real facts. And then you get the sort of fallacy of things. I was in a debate, I will not say where because it will make other people into trouble recently. The issue was raised of a case not resolved because data retention was not available. A, a case that in one European Union member state still made headlines, that was the first anniversary a few days ago of that case. And there, the privacy people said, yes, but it was not because of data retention. They didn't investigate good enough in the first place. So the arguments are always turned around. The, the, the goalposts are moved. It's a very difficult, almost impossible debate. What I would personally say is, Probably you need data retention, but you need clear rules, short retention periods, the conditions must be clear, the conditions for access to data must be clear, they must be more harmonized, and so on. That's what it probably uh, will end up to. I would like, since I have the floor, make another point that I believe is a much more difficult question these days, and that is that the difficulty, the, 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 the murky boundary between national security matters and criminal justice matters. Because many of the things that are not transparent are national security issues, and therefore it's not transparent. If you investigate somebody under a criminal procedure code with criminal law, there are all sorts of conditions, all sorts of obstacles, all sorts of safeguards that apply. Very few of them apply when it comes to national security matters. And that's for me right now, I see as the bigger issue, 
then the issue of data retention. And is that something that the Council of Europe will be helping to find a way through for everyone? Council of Europe, we are focusing on the criminal justice issue. Uh, I think our member states would be very nervous if we start to talk national security. And if you talk about the EU data protection framework that's currently discussed, it says it applies to this, it applies to that, the regulation for this, the, dir the draft directive on criminal justice area, and for national security, nothing applies. We have to make an exception because it's not in the competence of the EU. And that's, that's the difficult issue, national security versus criminal justice. Thank you. Um, I think Katitsa wants to come through, then Cornelia, and then I'm going to go back to the audience, so think of your questions, please. I would like to put actually two examples where uh, in two European member states was the retained data was used for illegal purposes and to spy on journalist sources. And we are talking about democratic countries, we are not talking about authoritarian regimes, and because I cannot point out um, exactly the country, um, that two countries one uh, very pro-privacy country. <laughs> um, there is also several challenges, constitutional challenges, were uh, that have declared the massive collections of everyone as citizens, um, which is data retention, um, and constitutional. I have referred that a challenge to the ECJ, the European Court of Justice. Uh, we have to be uh, seeing what's going on on this case, but there are also a lot of national constitution, national courts who have declared the directive unconstitutional. Um, I just want. Uh, no, no the, di the implementing law for the is correct. The implementing law for the directive unconstitutional. Uh, Bulgaria, I cannot mention, but Bulgaria, Romania, Germany, for example. <laughs> okay, Cornelia. Yeah, I, ju just uh, two, two, two things on, on data retention. Um, so, so there is indeed this this um, catch twenty two uh, situation that uh, companies are in um, when you have, on the one hand, data protection rules that are currently not necessarily harmonized well, and, and, and then national security or even criminal justice that also applies nationally and, and diverges. In the data retention directive, there is an attempt to harmonize, um, while you have in the e-privacy directive still an exemption on national security, so so off there goes the harmonization in one law, when in the other law you still have the exemptions that allow different rules. That is, I think, is something that, at least for now, the Commission has finally realized. Um, there is, of course, one thing we haven't mentioned. We, someone mentioned the, the the retention period. I think just as important and currently more important is the scope creep, uh, creep uh, that is happening. So um, currently this, this doesn't apply to, 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 to Google or Microsoft because we are, not a we, we are not regulated under the telecommunication package. Um, so this really refers only to telecommunication service providers. But of course in national member states we see that there is a tendency to expand scope and I think if, if there was already concerns from different stakeholders uh, engaged on proportionality of the data retention per se, I think then we should in particular be, be worried of extension in scope because the, the proportionality issue will be even more extreme. So this is, I think. Yeah. So if we're, we're picking up um, words that keep coming up in our discussions so far, even though we don't seem to be in complete agreement on many issues, uh, senses that there should be transparency, proportionality, uh, the, the conflict between, uh, on the one hand, uh, the criminal justice system which affords a great many protections for the individual and national security on the other hand where all of those just go out the window as does transparency and no one's talking about it. That's my summary. Um, I've got a lot of people asking for the floor, so can I ask you first to introduce yourself and where you're from to keep your remarks and your questions nice and crisp. Thank you. It's going to be very nice and crisp, I hope. Uh, my name is Ludo Kaiser. I'm from the Netherlands, uh, and actually I have a very uh, short question. 
I hope you won't find it disrespectful, but I would like to ask, uh, since we are talking about freedom and transparency, that if the panelists are mentioning cases or examples, to do mention the name of the country or the case what you are talking about. We are talking about transparency here, and for us it's a little easier to follow than what you exactly mentioned with the case. So that would be my question, actually, if you could please do mention the, you know, the names. Erla Flynn, please, can you respond? Well, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd first of all recommend you look at our transparency report, names and shames most countries in the world. Um, <laughs> and um, we, we did have a case uh, a number of years back where we got a, a request from the US Department of Justice uh, for uh, large quantities of search data. And um, uh, we believe that that request was, was overly broad, it was not uh, justified, and we ended up in, in a rather tough uh, legal battle, which we actually won uh, in the end, so I think sometimes you have to be prepared to, to fight uh, and resist government pressure because um, Keith is absolutely right, there can be a lot of government pressure on, on, on companies and I think, um, not to uh, reiterate the point too much, but I think transparency is one, one element that can help bring that out and allow for a more informed uh, public debate about how these things work and what, what's actually going on. Thank you. I have a couple of questions at the back. Okay, yes, please. So he's referring more to the rules of participation within the IGF. And it's very hard, for instance, to talk about two cases that are legal cases, you know, like Poland or um, Germany, where actually the data retention has been used illegally. So it's hard if you don't mention the country because um, there are good cases and they are public. So that sh should be, there should be any problem to resolve. Does that answer your question more? <laughs> Thank you. Please go ahead. Hello, um, my name is Sim Doisk. I'm from ISOC Estonia. Um, I actually have this sort of half comment, half question that um, um, I have followed the discussion to, I mean, I'm young and I don't really have that much experience, most of you, but uh, I have done my best. And I have found out that a lot of, um, especially Eastern European countries uh, or Central European countries have found the data, data retention directive unconstitutional or that the implementation should be written off or you know shouldn't be implemented differently and I have understood that the Commission more or less acknowledges it and wants to change the implementation but I don't really see so there is there is at least a light shining somewhere uh, but they don't really see the same and similar kind of attitude in net neutrality I mean all the things that Nelly Cross does they get blocked by everyone else so you know what in four years we have only done consultations and you know not really done anything substantial in net neutrality on the EU Commission level so who to blame okay so your challenge that this question is challenging us to change the subject a bit from data retention which I think our speaker from the Council of Europe would support because we might have a more rational debate let's try net neutrality so uh, Milton, do you have a response to that question? Maybe that's not fair as you're not within the EU, but I'm sure you know what's going on, right? I do, actually. Uh, we've done a lot of comparative research that includes the EU. Um, I'm, not, I'm having trouble understanding the link between uh, the security versus freedom debate and net neutrality, frankly. Um, so maybe somebody else could uh, explain that to me. Well, perhaps we can ask our, our questioner, did you want to... Uh, make clear the link uh, between uh, your question and the the freedom versus security issue the the point was um, in my opinion it's uh, it's mostly about consumer rights I mean in um, data retention the potential for abuse the potential for um, you know privacy in intrusions it is there but with net neutrality is it it is quite often certain you know, there is a difference between possibility in data retention and the net neutrality. If they get, you know, blocked from uh, using Skype or Viber or whatever, then uh, then they lose something immediately. So, or like throttled, then you know they are unable to use the service. So, what, what I'm what I'm trying to imply at the moment is the fact that although data retention is not, you know, it's not uh, something that we should just, you know, throw away. That you know, it's done with. I I do understand the problems, but in my opinion, it is somewhat as it was said before, it is something that we cannot really 
um, you know, it is too politicized, too, too intertwined, and and as I understood, as much as possible, the co the Commission already does something about it. But it is not the case with the net neutrality and with the with the consumer rights on on the EU level. So. Alexander Seeger, please, can you respond to that? And thank you very much for giving that clarification. I think it's, it's less here the question about the links between net neutrality and, and, and freedoms and so on. It's more about policy making and how you come to a consensus on things. And believe me, I, I personally believe, sorry, I personally believe, maybe you don't share it, but that you will also have very difficult agreement about redoing the data retention directive because the views are so different uh, they may discuss, but it may end up like with other policy areas. And this is typical, we experience that worldwide, that even in relatively small regions, or small but still important regions like the European Union, where you have a lot of harmony, in a way, between 27 member states, it's very difficult to come to a consensus on something. Beyond Europe, it's even more difficult, and globally, I would say almost impossible. Therefore. I'm also saying we should take what we have and run with it. We should be happy with what we have and run with it, make sense out of it, uh, work on implementing guidelines, clearer rules when it comes to implementation. Uh, but otherwise, very difficult. Thank you. I have a question here. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Eric Pigan. I'm a French member of the European Economic and Social Committee in Brussels. Two quick questions. Um, first of all, I've heard of transparency uh, before, this person from Google. I would like to, uh, him to clarify maybe for me uh, about the Patriot Act. I think that for with the Patriot Act, uh, transparency is somehow forbidden in a way that if a judge requires some data, uh, the judge or the government are not allowed to uh, the the provider is not allowed to alert and warn the, the customer, the owner of this data. That's, that was my understanding, uh, but maybe well, I'm wrong. Second thing... Well, sh can, can I just go to Ella Flynn here with that question while it's all in our minds? And then, um, So it's um, some transparency, but, n uh, but not in other cases, like uh, the Patriot Act. Um. Look, I'm, I'm not an expert on, on the Patriot Act. I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I, can, I can follow that up. But, but yes, there certainly are uh, some situations where you are legally not allowed to tell the person who is the subject of the request. Uh, our policy is to tell uh, the user uh, whenever we can. But if we're legally prohibited from doing so, then we, we, uh, we will not. Um, uh, people bring up the Patriot Act a lot. Uh, I guess it has a kind of a scary, a kind of sinister sounding name. Um, but uh, I will say that um, uh, it seems that many other countries have similar um, laws as well. I, I, I think it's not just the US. Um, others on the panel may know uh, the European laws in these areas, but I, I, I believe that's to be the case. That's not to say that there aren't uh, good questions and you've asked a good one around, around the, that particular piece of legislation. Um, I, I think K Katitza Rodriguez, you wanted the floor on this, and then I'm going to come to you, Alexander Seeger. To address this pro, uh, to address yeah this problem about um, due process, um, a coalition of civil society have come together and um, just draft a, a text, an international due process document. It's a draft. And you can find it in the website necessaryandproportionate.net, uh, where we outline um, which are the legal requirements in which we should um, analyze any surveillance law or the conditions um, requirements that any surve surveillance law should have. So in the case, for instance, of data retention, we should say that is not whether it's necessary or proportionate, uh, those measures. And I just to clarify about what it was discussed before about whether um, it has solved crime or not, the European Commission has not been Sorry, able to prove that it's necessary Can I just direct you to the question that was asked about yeah. the Patriot Act? You asked for the floor about that. Can you just give me a sentence on the Patriot Act? I think, I don't know the, the details of the Patriot Act, definitely yes, it have, uh, allows uh, for this, but it's not the only 
uh, country and that's why we have developed this set of international standards to improve surveillance laws around the world because as long as all the countries have minimum privacy protections that are strong against the government the more the data can flow at among countries yeah. thank you alexander sega I, th I think this is not an issue there may be more in patriot act and related legislation that may be difficult but it's a general it's, it's in the laws of most countries of the world that if you carry out criminal investigation, there's certain confidentiality involved. If you go to a judge, you get the order legally authorized under the laws of the country to wiretap somebody. Of course, you're not allowed to tell. If a police officer tells the person you will be wiretapped, uh, come on, that's the end of any investigation. So if now, if you have an investigation involving ICTs, you need a service provider <laughs> to participate technically, legally, whatever, practically, in such a uh, wiretapping, for example, it's normal that the, wire, the service provider would be asked to keep this confidential. This is a normal thing in criminal law. Uh, one can discuss boundaries and safeguards and so on, but it's a pretty normal principle. So your message is calm down, mm -hmm. it's normal. Okay. But that's why we have in the principles okay. that you have to just be well, justified. Uh, you know? I want to come to that, Katiza, because um, Looking at the questions, the central questions, I think it's been quite obvious for the last hour that there are issues which divide many people. Um, in well, let's not call it a balance. Let's call it these are these are legitimate interests. They sometimes compete with each other, and it's not always easy to see what the right, right way through is. But taking Alexander Sager's point, if we're g going for total consensus throughout the world, well. Is not going to happen in my lifetime, probably not in a young man like yours either. So, can we try to build on something positive, and uh, and think about where are the common ground between us, where, uh, uh, with people of good faith? What common steps can we take? Uh, now we've heard a lot of the speakers talk about we need to enunciate principles, we need the principles to be more detailed. Well, guys, this is our chance now. Can we actually try to enunciate those principles for ourselves now and try to build on the common ground? And that can, that's an invitation to the panel and also to the audience. I have two people asking for the floor here. <coughs> oh, sorry. Can, can we, is it? Sorry, my, my main question was actually not about Patriot Act. Uh, well, can you actually, I'm going to ask you a question. Can you actually tell us how you would have us move forward on these, th these, issue, these divisive issues, where you see the common ground as being, and uh, what next steps you think you would encourage us all to take to, to try to uh, uh, get the right uh, approach? Okay, I can try. Um, First of all, when there we are talking about innovation, let's say that Internet is an innovation, there is always something that uh, linked us to the past. Yeah? And if you think about Internet, there are things that are issues with Internet that are always that we had before. Let me use a metaphor for Internet. Uh, when I drive my car on, uh, on a road in Europe, on an autobahn or whatsoever, first of all, I need to have a driving license, one. Second, if the police stop, if the police stops me and ask him, ask me for my driving license or ID card, I'm not going to cry and complain about uh, an attack against my free my freedom, right? So the point is why on internet, and it's not on this highway that we are talking about information highway that we are talking about, isn't it worth to say that people should have a driving license at least? to do some, some kinds of operation, maybe not everything, first. And then, this is about responsibility. Think about child abuse. There are big things going on, yeah? So, should we be able, should we uh, be obliged to identify ourselves when we do certain things? Uh, so that if the police uh, catch us, they know who we are. And at the moment, this is not, we say that this is freedom. To me, this is license. It's not freedom. Okay. Thank you very much. And thank you for being um, 
game for me asking you the questions rather than the other way around. So our way forward, Milton Muller, is for, uh, is it users or is it providers who need the license? Is it, is, is it users? Okay, well, let's take it as users. So the way forward out of this conundrum is for users to have a license. Discuss. Yeah. Um, easier said than done. So uh, remember what is goes into a driver's license. There is a government that has a monopoly on jurisdiction within its territory. It has uh, testing systems. It has checkpoints. Uh, it is an elaborate uh, bureaucratic and institutional hierarchy that upon which this is based. Now, if you can tell me that we have such a government at the global level that could enforce an internet-wide uh, uh, identity system, then I would lend this proposal some feasibility, even though I still wouldn't like it. Uh, I think that th it's easy to wave your hands and talk about identity and people being identified, but in fact, identity uh, is something that is much, much more complicated than than all th than, than simply saying you're going to have a license. Um, uh, so. Let me give you a simple example of some of the tricky things that can happen. It's a very simple example. Um, our uh, library at the Syracuse University thought that they were going to make uh, their systems more secure by forcing you to log in uh, when you wanted to check the catalog. Uh, uh, before that, you could just walk up to a computer terminal, search for a book, and walk away. And now, this, uh, I don't know what kind of security was being accomplished here. They uh, because let's suppose you log into that, uh, the system has set up an image uh, so that when I log in the library, you can see my desktop in my office. You can access my email uh, simply by clicking a button. So I've logged in and I've deposited my identity on a public terminal in the library. Now suppose, not that I would ever do this, but suppose I walked away from that terminal and forgot to log out. Maybe, no, but uh, maybe let's say 15% of the people who do that do. And suppose somebody comes along afterwards. Well, it's obvious that this system has actually increased my risk uh, by forcing me needlessly to log in. And that's just a very small example of, uh, you know, again, magnify that globally, magnify that across all Internet services, all devices. Uh, and just more fundamentally, I, I object to the fact of getting a license before doing something as natural as communicating with my fellow people uh, uh, obviously, there are things you have to identify yourself for, but uh, communication and, uh, you know, extensions of communication, I think, is probably not one of them most of the time. Thank you. We have a question here, sir. Um, yeah, the, the French colleague mentioned um, looking into the past, uh, but I would also say let's look into the future and where we're going with the data. And Sorry, can we just... Uh, ah, sorry, did you introduce I introduce yourself. Uh, yes, my name is Ilyas Naibov. I am from Tassim Project. Um, uh, we should look into the future, and when we look at that, we will see that where we are going in is some kind of a second brain on the internet. Our thinking, our data, is not now limited to our brains, physical brains, but it's now distributed across the internet. So my question is. Uh, should we really distinguish between our actions online that are communications with the others and the data that is purely ours and is, in a sense, an extension of our brain? That's my question. I, I like the idea of the Internet being an extension of, of our brains. Um, are there any more questions from the audience or comments? Yes? this on? Okay. If we're going to use the driving analogy for the internet... Can oh, you just introduce yourself? Karen Riley from the Tor Project. If we're going to use the driving analogy, I'd like to present that the internet is more like a system in which you can borrow someone's face and their car without them knowing about it. So that a license doesn't do much in terms of catching criminals, because criminals will always circumvent technical means of surveilling them. Uh, criminals but can... For, they for will that, sorry to interrupt you, but because criminals break laws, does that mean we should just give up and go away and not bother to make any? No, we shouldn't, but we should base, uh, we should base policy on the premise that criminals will have technical means that surpass 
those of ordinary citizens, especially those who are stakeholders in issues that are used as justification for data retention and widespread surveillance. We work with uh, victims of human trafficking and according to many good reports, among them the UN Office on Drugs and Crime, corruption is a factor in many of these heinous and cross-border crimes. So that law enforcement with great powers of data retention, if you are not stealing bandwidth and equipment, is one of your threats. So I would like for to build, to make these discussions more productive, I would like to bring together more stakeholders um, to have a realistic discussion about um, bringing these problems that are talked about as if they only exist online back into the place where these problems actually occur. The people creating surveillance equipment, law enforcement, um, survivors of crime, uh, and NGOs that work on the ground need to be talking together instead of having their own conferences separately because I don't think you'll have a, a, a productive solution uh, when everybody is, is talking in uh, separate forums. Thank you. A anything else, sir? We'll have a reaction from Katitsa, and then I'm going to come to you and then you, sir, so we can get the mics lined up. I think uh, I would like also to react to the question of the driving licensing. And I think we should clarify that or make clear that anonymity, anonymity is crucial for, uh, for minorities, for whistleblowers, for uh, victims of, you know, <laughs> of, I don't know, for uh, journalist sources, when you are talking, uh, interviewing um, your sources that need to be hidden because they're political pressures, there are a lot of reasons why you just want to be anonymous or just, just because you don't want to be targeted by ads. So you know? And so that is cr critical for free expression and but privacy. To, to, to run with the, the, quest, the questioner's uh, uh, point there, where would you see um, uh, responsibility? Because he talked about uh, people having responsibility. You're talking about anonymity being uh, essential in some situations. Who do you see as having responsibility to make sure that that isn't abused? So, because we all know that in, in other environments, anonymity uh, brings out the worst in human instincts in many cases. So, where does responsibility lie, perhaps? I mean, I, sorry to put you on the spot with that, but anyone? Well, I was going to go for another answer, which I'm still going to try. <laughs> but I really like the comment from the lady from the Tor uh, project, because I think that criminals are only where the money is. So if one comment is if we would be able to push the limits back on the easy making money which they have at present, that would actually drive them back to whatever they were doing before or other opportunities that the future may present. But anyway, the internet has to become something like when we walk the street here, you can turn the wrong corner, but usually it's safe because there's police, etc. And if we now fly from the end user to the state, we as citizens all expect our government to protect us in whatever way. And I think that you can get a consensus on that, what a government's basic functions on that topic is, also gives them certain rights, but only have to take those rights as far as they're by law allowed to do. So in other words, I think we agree on that, that if we walk the street, that we have the idea that we're protected by our government. So, oh, so why not on the internet? Let's test that principle with the audience. Okay, I'll turn hands street up, here. But hands <laughs> up who agrees with the principle that we expect uh, our governments to protect us. I'm not voting. Hmm. That seems a little way short of our we all in agreeing. It's just, uh, I make no comment on it myself. It's a, just, no, I think the point the speaker was making about is, is actually offline, is, is in, our, in our daily life, we expect the government to protect us. But the question was, okay. uh, do we expect it, uh, <laughs> when you're talking online, which government are you talking about? And, and I'm getting from, from Erla, uh, from what, and from Katitsa, 
so who's going to protect me from the government. Uh, so, does anybody have something uh, that we can all agree with, please? <laughs> Sir? I think that uh, all of us agree on the road on the question of license if they knew that uh, cyberspace is uh, more risky than uh, the uh, streets we are walking in each day. So why do we have to have a license on streets and not in cyberspace? Because it's a more risky world? Do what about your children? Can they go out uh, on the street, take a car, and uh, go uh, do whatever they want with the car? Definitely not. And as for the role of the government, the government, yes, is supposed to protect their citizens. We are still citizens in cyberspace. And, and Milton's question on that is, and who is the government in that context? Is it our national governments, regional, or is it some other? So you've been waiting for the microphone. Can we get the microphone down here? Thank you. Uh, my name is Lionel Fair. I'm the ambassador for human rights from the Netherlands. So you won't be surprised if I take the freedom angle on this. I always feel that uh, when you talk about internet, you have to be very careful in comparisons like with driver's license, which may seem innocent. But I think the crucial question is, do we need additional restriction? I think for us, freedom comes first. But of course, as a government, we also have responsibility to protect, to provide security, etc. But I think it's the balance that you have to find as a government between those two. Like in the Netherlands, we try to take a multi-stakeholder approach, multi, also multi-departmental approach. We set up what we call a cybersecurity council in which we try to bring all these partners together taking the view that uh, you have to find this balance between security and freedom and that you also have to include this multidisciplinary multi-stakeholder approach but also try to include business make it a private public uh, say operation because if you talk about uh, restrictions you talk about surveillance you talk about big companies selling the hardware to make surveillance possible. You talk about the telecom providers who are in it to make the money. And I think somehow it's, I think it be, you cannot solve this problem. I will not try to give the definitive answer here, but I think as a Dutch government, we try to make this approach to make the two agendas meet, like the agenda for security and the agenda for freedom. But from the, say, from the, from the human rights perspective, I think Whenever in doubt, freedom comes first. Thank you. Okay, let's try that one out. Whenever in doubt, freedom comes first. Anyone agree with that? Hmm, maybe we're getting somewhere. Um, so Cornelia Kutera, you wanted to make a remark. Yes, I, 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 th I think the Dutch example is, is, is within the European Union certainly a best practice in how the discussion is going in, in public-private partnerships. Uh, I think in cybercrime uh, and cybersecurity, all stakeholders around this table are on the same side. Um, so we are, we, are, we are fighting the same cause. And, and so uh, we will have to, to, to be um, clear when, for example, information sharing is necessary in let's say in a in in the case of botnet fights where companies might actually need to share information that has uh, pri um, identifiable information in it in order to protect the customer citizens that are maybe part of a botnet um, and and so that governments through certs or isps in that corporation can actually help them clean their their computers um, these are cases where where we just need to have that cooperation going on same for child safety i'm sometimes i, I must say personally a little bit frustrated how uh, the the discussion around unintended consequences actually I I impacts um, the the possibilities to fight um, 
uh, sexual child abuse online. This is certainly currently happening in the European Union. Um, and if we could get around this somehow by maybe setting forth principles so that legitimate concerns of unintended consequences would not always get in the way to actually doing something good, um, that would be very helpful too. Um, last, I think, um, on, on a point which was made here on, on um, criminals go always around, I think another recommendation I would m put forward is that any of these issues are processes. It, it's something which is very, very normal in security. You talk about security in, in terms of process, and we might want to expand this in, in terms of the human rights. It is the process of the company, how it's implementing the human rights agenda in their services, in their consideration. It is the process of developing secure software, a secure cloud. Um, being transparent not only about, um, it's, it's not only, and that might eventually also depend on the region you're talking about, it's not only about the, the governments, um, it's also about private companies themselves, how they treat data, what is their business model behind in order to, to, to use the data, and what is the fair uses of, of data processing. I think there, the, 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 the issue around consumer protection was mentioned. I think we are getting in that space into, into the fair use of data as an as a additional con concept um, uh, than what we already have in consumer protection rather than only consent-based um, processing of data. So there is quite a lot we can actually already start to implement. Thank you uh, for that po positive encouragement to, you know, to, we can't always do the perfect thing, but it, is it, isn't it better to do something that we know is good and then mop up the unintended consequences afterwards if indeed they are there? I don't know if everyone would agree with that, but uh, just in the, we've got time for just one more question. One more. Who wants to, to take the floor? Anybody? You do? Can we get a, a microphone very quickly, please, to this, to this gentleman here? And then, um, as, as I, I sense that our time is coming to a close, so we'll just take one more comment and, and then uh, uh, we'll draw to a close. I'm from Foreign Ministry of Azerbaijan. I'm not uh, very good on, uh, so to say, on internet space, but listening to your discussions. Uh, oh, I'm <laughs> sorry. Uh, <coughs> listening to your discussions, when you want to divide between the uh, uh, national legislation and international, uh, how to regulate, how to put guidelines for internet, uh, I think that in international law, in international relations, we have a problem. Not in some nations, they recognize supremacy of international law o over the national law. Some nations, no, they say my national law is more important than international guidelines. What if the internet is a common space? And I agree that we, we cannot put internet into uh, regulate based only on the national law. What if we put some guidelines under maybe UN, uh, so to say, uh, <laughs> framework, uh, this kind of international guidelines for international law, which will uh, be developed based on the freedom, uh, I mean, uh, free flow of information, and at the same time put some, uh, in cases where, it, where there is the abuse of uh, internet space, we put some common regulations which are over the national sovereign legislation. I think there is only one way to, because internet is by essence is a common space. We cannot, uh, <laughs> so say, divide it into the, n the national homes. I yes, it's like a maritime legislation. It is common for the for the whole countries who have access the the. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, uh, this gives an opportunity for all of us as well to thank our hosts in Azerbaijan for a wonderful meeting. So thank you very much for that. I'd like to, um, yeah, I'll maybe yeah. say, <laughs> can, we, can we just, um, first of all, we, we are now 
on um, at our time. So I would like to thank all of our panelists for uh, for their very wise contributions and also for being very good sports. Uh, for the audience who've really made uh, the discussion uh, exist uh, as as a, a whole room rather than just talking heads on the panel. So thank you very much for your contributions. Uh, I don't think we got very far with our, um, our way forward, unfortunately. Uh, I think the, the phrase that, that seemed to strike the, the most resonance with the people in the room is, when in doubt, freedom comes first. And perhaps that can be something for us to take away with us and to build on as we, uh, as we work uh, on these difficult issues in the future. Thank you very much, everyone. Well done. Didn't get to you. Yeah, <laughs> enough okay. time. Thank I you very I much. I want to reply to the Sarvajani, why you didn't allow me. <laughs> <laughs> That's an okay. art in itself to, oh. to, to be able to moderate. Well, really. <laughs> <laughs> You're all. So maybe one. Yeah. Yeah. Yesterday. <laughs> 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 Did you ever succeed in getting uh, in an event?